All right, so we are ready to start the cardiovascular imaging uh, session. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Kakelris to you. Uh, Dr. Kakelris is uh, trained as a theoretical particle physicist, actually, and he has an outstanding track record of research in CT, computer tomography, ranging from image acquisition and reconstruction. And uh, I am very excited to hear what he has to tell us about the latest advancement in this technology applied to cardiac imaging and how we can learn from it uh, to improve other imaging modalities such as MRI. Thank you so much. So I give you Dr. Kakaris. Yes, thank you very much for the nice introduction and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's really a great pleasure and this is a great meeting as far as I saw. Um, my presentation will be a little more, a bit more uh, technical compared to the first ones because uh, I'm basically, as we just heard, involved in a lot of uh, developments regarding basics in CT, like imagery construction or CT systems. And uh, we developed some tricks in CT reconstruction which uh, may also be used for other modalities. And the last slides might show some examples which you might find useful even if you are not so much interested in CT. But first of all, I want to talk about cardiac CT imaging as it's a very important modality uh, to do cardiac diagnosis, in particular if you want to rule out uh, stenosis of a patient before he's going to an interventional room. So uh, just, to give a, just to give a short overview of diagnostic CT in general, you see that we have four major vendors and you see that an X-ray source is rotating uh, 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 around the patient pretty quickly and this allows us uh, to, to reconstruct images of the density uh, of the patient more or less. Typically today we do spiral CT scans, so not, uh, it's not just a circle, but the patient is typically transported through the CT system continuously, so it's like called a spiral CT trajectory. And now, since we also talk about dose, I have to go a little bit into detail of how CT systems are internally designed. And what you see here is not drawn to scale. You rather see it drawn in a way so that you can easily see what I want to show you. Uh, so we have an anode that is rotating, and the electrons that hit the anode, they make these x-rays, right? So this is the view uh, along the patient, and this is the side view on the right-hand side. And you can see that this anode has a certain angle, which plays an important role in cardiac CT imaging as well. And once the CT, uh, the x-rays have been generated, they run through a series of filters and the uh, most important aim of those filters, which also will play a role later, is to remove radiation from coming to the patient, such radiation that would not make it through the patient. So we want to remove the low energy photons of the CT x-rays before they go to the patient because we want to have very little x-ray dose also for cardiac CT imaging. Now there are different CT systems and they might differ in the size of the detector. So this is a very large detector shown here. Uh, it requires a smaller anode angle, but there are also systems that have a smaller detector and they can do with a larger anode, uh, with a smaller anode angle, as you can see here. I swip, uh, go back and forth. And the difference between these two, and we will also highlight this later when coming to the cardiac CT dose, is that the electron beam must be a smaller beam when hitting this kind of uh, anode with a larger angle compared to the small angle anode. This beam can be much thicker, so we can have more electrons, more tube power for those kind of X-ray tubes with a, smaller uh, with a smaller anode angle. There is no difference in spatial resolution because the patient is seeing the X-ray tube from the below, so you will have the same spatial resolution in these two situations. That's important to understand. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have the narrow comb beam, which allows for high tube voltage and high tube power, not voltage, high tube power. And on the right-hand side, you have the wide cone uh, uh, beam, so with many detector rows, like 256 or 320 is typical, which does not allow for such high tube powers. Okay, so before we start with cardiac CT, here are some figures that are typical for CT systems today. Uh, you can see that we typically achieve a spatial resolution of significantly below half a millimeter and uh, the tube um, uh, has a significant power up to 120 kilowatts for an x-ray tube. That's quite, uh, that's quite a lot in those systems today. 
The rotation times, which uh, play a role in cardiac imaging, are very fast, so, so very low rotation times, like 0 0.25 seconds, and probably vendors will soon go to the 0 0.2 second uh, rotation time. And the scan speeds can be very fast, so up to 73 centimeters per second. Yeah, so these numbers, if you compare them to other modalities, are quite impressive here. So I just illustrate how fast such a CT scan can be, and you can see a 56 centimeter scan range, and I will show you three images. On the left side, you see the scan protocol, and that's how fast the scan is being done. In the middle, you see how those images are acquired, and on the right-hand side, you can see a volumetric display. So this gives an impression of how fast CT systems are today. Now, why do we, do, why do we need cardiac CT? Everything is so fast, right? But, uh, we also know that the coronaries, they move pretty, pretty fast. So they move uh, with speeds up to seven centimeters per second. Now, if you want to have a spatial resolution of 0 0.5 millimeters, you can now calculate that you have to have a very high temporal resolution, like uh, maybe five milliseconds or 10 milliseconds, in order to freeze the motion, uh, in order to avoid motion blurring. And even with CT systems rotating as fast as I have shown, um, the temporal resolution is not fast enough. So uh, uh, imaging is still a, a problem and we need to have new ideas of uh, how to improve in cardiac CT. So this uh, presentation is divided in two pieces. First of all, we talk about what we know of what we call cardiac CT. So in fact, we mean diagnostic cardiac imaging, which uh, means that the CT system is rotating very quickly. Uh, so the scan is much faster than one motion cycle. But you might know there are also other systems around, for example, those that are used during interventions with uh, C-arm systems, with a cone beam CT, they rotate very slowly. So they ro rotate slower than one motion cycle of the heart and even slower than one respiratory motion cycle. And also there we can think of doing imaging of moving objects like the lung and the heart. And this is uh, the second part of my presentation where I want to talk about these kind of systems. Now in cardiac CT, uh, there's one vendor that has a special system. Uh, it has two X-ray sources and two detectors mounted in the system. So what's, uh, what's this for? Uh, the advantage is uh, if in order to acquire data to make a CT image, we need 180 degrees of rotation, right? So for a system with one X-ray tube, this, this means the scanner has to rotate by 180 degrees. For such a system, it means the scanner only has to rotate by 90 degrees. So the temporal resolution achievable with such a system is twice as high as with systems that only have a single X-ray source. So this is a dedicated cardiac CT uh, uh, system that you see here. So now we want to do images of the heart and typically one has to assume that the heart is quasi periodically moving because you typically stitch together more images of different heart cycles and you need some kind of synchronization. Uh, we use the ECG signal in most cases to know when the patient uh, is, has his systole or diastole. And then you can, either, you can either start the scan whenever you want to do the images. So this is what we would call prospective gating. Or you can also do an, whatever, a, a data acquisition. And when you do the image reconstruction, you can decide which data to use for the image reconstruction. For example, the diastolic data. And then you can produce a diastolic image, for example. And this is what we would call retrospective gating. So there are two different techniques around, prospective and retrospective gating. Prospective gating was uh, used in the 80s and 90s, so quite a long time ago, but with not much success. And then retrospective gating made a big success in cardiac CT. And today we have a mix of both, uh, of both options. As you can already probably tell, prospective gating is uh, maybe a little bit less robust than retrospective gating, because if you think of patients that have a, uh, uh, an, an irregular heart rate, or for example, extra systoles that show up in the ECG, but that do not show up as motion, you can probably have a prospective gating, uh, uh, prospectively gated scan, but it's done maybe at the wrong time position in the heart. So if you know that the uh, heart is beating irregularly, you could decide for a retrospectively gated scan. So both uh, options are in use today, and I will show images for both of these types of uh, data acquisitions. On the left side, it's uh, again, it's, there are some pictograms. On the left side, you see what I use for retrospective gating. So this is, illustrates a spiral CT scan, where after the spiral CT scan, you decide how to reconstruct the images. And on the right-hand side, you see the prospective gating. Prospective gating means 
no, I don't find my mouse pointer, here it is, that you might want to do several circle scans and, and increase the ta table by a bit and then do another circle scan. Or you might want to do a high pitch spiral scan. So these two options exist today. If you have a scanner that has a large cone angle, you might not even need to do uh, many circle scans. Maybe one circle scan may be sufficient. For example, the Toshiba system, it has a, a coverage of 16 centimeters, so you can cover the heart in a single circle scan, right? Uh, but if you use the Siemens system, for example, you might need two or three steps uh, when doing this kind of prospective gating, like shown on the left side, but you can also do the high pitch uh, uh, scan if you like. So this just illustrates that the synchronization with the heart, uh, uh, with the ECG, uh, is done in order to find the desired motion uh, phases of the, of the patient. So in uh, patients with a lower heart rate, you would like to do uh, diastolic scans. In patients with higher heart rates, where the diastole becomes shorter and shorter, you would prefer to do systolic scans, typically. So how, what to do with the data after they have been acquired? So there are two different techniques uh, in use to do the image reconstruction. One is called partial scan reconstruction, which is very simple. As I said, you need 180 degrees of data. And those 180 degrees of data are whatever it's illustrated here. There's some kind of data window within this heartbeat. You take those 180 degrees of data and do a reconstruction. Uh, so that's a very simple technique, and that's the most dominant done today. But when cardiac CT evolved, like about 20 years ago, scanners were too slow, uh, like on this, this is a pretty old slide, like on this slide, so the, the temporal resolution of this kind of scan was too low. So there was an option to do multi-segment reconstruction, um, which means you can collect those 180 degrees of data from several heartbeats, like three times 60 degrees, and stitch them together and do a reconstruction, and then you can improve the temporal resolution by a factor of three compared to what I showed on the previous slide. So these two uh, options are available to do the image reconstruction um, in cardiac CT. So it's important to know if you want to have a retrospectively gated uh, cardiac CT scan, which means a cardiac CT scan where after you have done the acquisition, you want to decide which cardiac phase to, do, uh, to reconstruct, you have to have a very low data, a slow data acquisition. Yeah, the spiral uh, has to be very, uh, very low. Has to have a very low pitch value, which means that uh, each voxel of the patient needs to be seen by the X-rays as long as one heart cycle takes. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the chance to retrospectively decide in which heart phase to do the reconstruction. So there's a certain constraint on the pitch value for uh, those uh, retrospectively gated scans, and that's basically the equation uh, that uh, determines this pitch value. Now I'll show you some images. And this is, uh, I think this image was done with a dual saw CT system, but not with the latest one. It's maybe like done three or four years ago, which illustrates that with dual saw CT, uh, you can have a very high temporal resolution uh, in a way so that you can have uh, reliable images uh, in the diastole and also in the typically faster moving systolic phase, <laughs> as you can see here. What we want to do in, in, in cardiac CT predominantly is have a look at the coronaries and find out whether there are stenosis or not, right? And we might also want to see whether there are plugs in the patient, and we want, want, maybe want to characterize what type of plugs does the patient have uh, and how stable those plugs are. So this is the main reason why we do cardiac CT. So you get reliable images, as shown here. This is a retrospectively gated scan, so you can do a reconstruction in any, car in any heart phase. You could even reconstruct moving images. This is a scan. Uh, done with a high pitch spiral, and uh, so you have to decide the, for the cardiac phase in advance, and you can see you can, we also get very nice images, so this is a more modern CT system. And I also want to emphasize, and I will explain in a moment why, uh, that the dose is very low, so you can see an effective dose of half a millisievert. So I don't know the numbers in the US very accurately, but I think uh, in the US you typically get an annual radiation uh, uh, from non-medical exposures, from, so from the natural background and from other civilized exposures by about 2.4 millisievert in the US. So it, uh, maybe it's more, I'm not sure. In Germany it's 2.1. So if you compare this scan with half a millisievert to the 2.4 millisievert, you will find out it's really just like uh, whatever, maybe a quarter of a year of, of, of exposure that you get with such a scan. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not a very high dose level, right? 
Also, in the news, you often read about CT being a high-dose modality. So this has to be uh, regarded very careful such sta statements. In particular, they should be put into relation with the kind of information that you can get from such images, right? That's just another example for a sequence scan, so several circles, uh, uh, as shown here. Also, you can see the coronaries are depicted up to their very finest ends, and you can do a very very nice uh, reading of these, of these kind of images. And of course, if you do retrospective gating, you can also see functional studies, or in this case, there's an aortic valve that uh, one, uh, want to see, one wants to see how it works and whether it's impl implanted correctly, right, in this here. So now, what about the dose? So uh, there are certain de reasons for uh, increased radiation dose uh, due to CT. And the most important reason is cardiac CT as such, because it is a new modality, right? Maybe we started like 10 to 15 years ago to, to use it with patients a lot and more and more. So it will contribute more and more to the dose, uh, 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 to, the, to, the, to the dose from medical exposures in general. And of course, we want to have higher spatial resolution, and we might have more and new interesting cardiac applications, so we use it more and more, and the dose might increase. And in fact, if you, if you, look, at a, if you look at a study uh, performed by Hausleiter, they, they were observing very high dose values, so up to 30 millisieverts. So this study was published in 2009, and they were showing that the cardiac CT scans range somehow, I think, I'm not sure, if it was from 5 or from 10 millisievert to 30. So there was a wide range. Uh, people were not really using it adequately. Uh, the image quality in this wide range of dose values was almost the same. So uh, there had to be some kind of new technologies to reduce the dose and to help the user uh, to use those CT devices in a way uh, that they are more efficient. So there are several countermeasures to decrease dose, and I listed a few of them below here. I will discuss in a moment about new X-ray tubes and the prefiltration. Uh, but if you look at, uh, at another paper that came up a few years later, you will find out uh, that it's now possible to reduce the X-ray dose quite significantly. So those people were talking about dose values of below one millisievert. I would say one to two millisievert is for normal persons, not for small patients, where it's lower, uh, is something a reasonable value. And uh, they also published this kind of figure. So this is more or less the annual, the red bar is the annual background dose. And you can see different, different scan strategies. So these are the very old ones, and these are the very new ones on the right-hand side. And you can see how the dose goes down with cardiac CT. So we can get better images today at lower dose. So why, why, why is that? So how can we reduce the dose? And in order to look at that, let's, let's look what the X-ray tubes did in the last 10 years. And this is from one vendor, two different X-ray tubes. So this one is a pretty new one. This is an older one. And what I did, and everyone who has access to a CT scanner can do this for his own system, go to the CT scanner, enter a scan, uh, and change the scan time and find out how much tube power does the tube allow. So if you, if you increase the MA value, for example, if you increase it too much, it will give you a warning and say, no, that's not possible. You c I cannot have a 20-second scan with 500 MA. So that's how you can get these kind of curves. And the red curves are for the older tube here. And you can see 10 years ago, X-ray tubes were optimized for longer scan times. And today, they are optimized for shorter scan times, but much more X-ray power, right? So that's very important to know. We have more power today, but I said we have less dose. So this sounds like contradictory. I will show you in a moment why this is uh, important to have high X-ray power. And we also see here, so this is, a, so I did this experiments with many vendors. Um, so we can see here also, if you, for 80 kV, that's a similar plot, how much power we can get for some uh, tube. So this one is optimized for very high tube power at very low tube voltages. So that's at 80 kV. And on the next page, I show you what happens at 120 kV. So you can see at 120 kV, tube power is up to 120 kilowatts. And I go back, and that's 80 again. So the, the maximum power you can get is about 100 kilowatts. Why? On the right side, you see a little CT image. Uh, with low tube voltage, you can see with contrast agent in the heart, you can see a better contrast than with high tube voltage. So we would like to, we would prefer doing scans at low tube voltage. 
And in order to have more contrast, and uh, this might also, ha also help us to reduce the X-ray dose and also to reduce the amount of contrast agent we need for the patient. Okay? So why do we need such a high X-ray X -ray power? So this gives you a, an X-ray spectrum. Uh, so, so that's 120 kV, but it, it would look very similar with 80 kV. Uh, two different X-ray spectra. One is with and one is without a pre-filter after the X-ray source and before the patient. And obviously the pre-filter takes away uh, all this radiation here at the low energies, right? So the green one is with a pre-filter. So this is before the patient. That's why I write zero millimeters of water. If we assume the patient is 320 millimeters of water, we see both spectra look identical. So after the patient, the low photons will have no chance to go to the detector, so it's good to remove them before the patient in order to reduce the patient dose. So we want to have a very thick pre-filter, right? And this gives us a low dose. And now we come back to this slide. Narrow cone beam is a high tube power, and a wide cone beam is a low tube power, as you also saw in these curves before. And we can have a thick pre-filter here, but we can only have a thinner one here. So we naturally have lower dose values for the X-ray uh, systems, for the CT systems that have a lower cone angle, so that have not as many slices as would be, pos as would be possible today. Okay? Thicker pre-filters, lower KV, and we can operate at lower dose. And here we have to have higher dose on, this, on the right-hand side. Okay, and with these, uh, with these uh, uh, technical developments, we can do CT scans at very low dose values, actually. You can see here an example of a child. So that's just a one centimeter bar is on the right side, so you can see it's a very small heart, very small dose, 0 0.05 millisieverts. And this is a slide that just illustrates how the advancements have been taken uh, when you go uh, down to 70 kV scanning, for example. You can see the dose values, and you can look at the image quality, for example, if you like. Okay, now we have heard a lot of uh, nice things about cardiac CT. We have a low to moderate radiation dose. It's a very robust modality, but it requires some user experience, so it's not very easy to, uh, to use it. You need to know how to prepare the patient and what kind of scan mode to choose. Uh, we have a very high isotropic and temporal resolution, and one can, which I didn't show, but one can reliably rule out stenosis in patients with chest pain. And chest pain may have many reasons, so it might be good uh, for a patient to go into a CT before he goes into the cath lab. There are several new developments. Uh, so first, I will talk about the last one, but this uh, very important one is fractional flow reserve computation uh, in CT, which is possible. And then it gives you also the answer to the question, which narrowings in the coronaries really cause blood flow problems? Yeah, not all of them do. Then uh, also a lot of research is done in plug characterization. You can see some plugs over there, right? And you would like to characterize them. So uh, you would like to know how, how likely is, uh, is it that they rupture or not, for example. And there's also an issue with the motion uh, because uh, the motion is of the heart is still too fast. And that's what I'm going to talk, out, uh, talk about in the following. So we might still have motion artifacts. Also, I was very positive about cardiac CT so far, right? So we have this problem. Here's an example. We have a rotation time of 250 milliseconds, so we need 125 milliseconds to do a scan. The coronary might move at 50 millimeters per second, so this means it's a movement of six millimeters uh, during the scan time, uh, which is too much to get it depicted sharp. And uh, now I also show you those images that have artifacts. Yeah, up to now, I've only shown you very nice images, but we also have artifacts. And let's say maybe in 10 to 20 percent of the patients, uh, you might have problems with the, with the image quality, and there's uh, a lot of room for further improvement. And uh, so, what the future in cardiac CT uh, image reconstruction is motion compensation. So it means we want to find out how is the coronary artery moving, and once we know how it's moving, we can compensate for it during image reconstruction. So image reconstruction means back projecting the rays into the image. <coughs> and uh, if we know if something is moving in this direction with the speed, we can easily compensate for it. It's more difficult to find out how it's moving. Okay. So we need to reduce those motion artifacts, and there have been several algorithms proposed uh, for single source CT. I personally believe they also are also valid or important for dual source CT, uh, but they have not been 
used yet for dual source CT. So this, uh, uh, this generalization is not too difficult to make. Um, but uh, we will talk about a single source CT motion compensation in a moment. And uh, since I also, uh, I'm also very dose aware, as are the patients, we want to focus on scan protocols that use the minimal amount of scan range, so only 180 degrees of data and not more, So which is like the prospective gated scan where I only acquire as little data as possible. And uh, those methods, of course, they are especially beneficial in cases of patients with higher or irregular heart rates. Yeah? For a patient that has a low heart rate and very regular, you can get perfect cardiac images already with the systems today. Still, I show you an example down here. This is a retrospectively gated scan, and there's a so-called best phase. So this is the phase that shows the least motion artifacts. It's like, it's, for this patient, it was 71% between the R peaks. And if you just move a little, a few percent points away from this best phase, like at 66%, you already start seeing significant motion artifacts. So it's very important to find the best phase and to do the X-ray imaging right only in this best phase. But it's not easy to do so. So we need to compensate for the motion if we have those artifacts. Here are some algorithms. Uh, we talk about the last ones. You can see the dose usage of the algorithm. So how much dose goes into that image that the physician is looking at of the do dose that has been exposed to the patient, and we want to have 100% dose usage. So the last one is uh, of importance to us. It's using 180 degrees of data as a data range, and we want to do reconstruction. So the problem is we have 180 degrees of data, which is just enough data to compute one single CT image. How would, should we find out about the motion in one single CT image, right? If I have more than 180 degree data, I can compute, let's say, three images, one slightly before, one slightly after and the image I want to see. And from these three images, I can determine how the coronary artery is moving. But if I have just one image, it's not, not so easy, but it's possible. And the idea uh, uh, that we do is uh, basically we find out uh, that you have artifacts, motion artifacts. And if, if you have a measure to quantify the motion artifacts, you can find out the image or the motion direction and the motion speed that gives you the image with the least motion artifacts. And that's what we do here in this partial angle motion compensation algorithm. You can see that's the initial CT image with motion artifacts. We cut out a certain region of the CT image around the coronary artery. We do a forward projection, so we generate a sinogram, which is typically 180 degrees long, but we just divide it into 10 degrees pieces. So actually we have 18 sinograms. Yeah? Of, of, uh, of a smaller size. And we can do a reconstruction of such a sinogram and we get a volume looking like this. So we get 18 volumes. I only th show you three of them. And if we add together these 18 volumes, we get the image on the left side. So that's nothing new, right? Uh, but before we do this, we find out, ah, no, first of all, the temporal resolution of this one would be 150 milliseconds for a certain rotation time. And the temporal resolution of this one would be, uh, it's not 18, it's 15, sorry, it's 10 milliseconds. So they have a high temporal resolution on the right-hand side. But before we add them, we find out a vector of how to move them against in each other in order to add them up to make up a better image, an image with le less motion artifacts than the initial image. And maybe for those of you who do MR imaging, they can also think of making this method useful for MR imaging. Uh, what we do is we quantify the image quality by using the entropy uh, of the resulting image. And we use, choose the motion vector fields shown here in a way to get the minimal entropy of the resulting image. We have a, sm a small motion model also for, to, to reduce the number of unknowns. So we do this on the coronary arteries. There are certain points on the coronary arteries where we span a polynomial. And we just need to find a few coefficients of this polynomial. And then we can do this minimization job. And it's quite surprising because it works in all cases that we have looked at so far. So this is a patient. This is co conventional reconstruction. And this is the motion compensated. MOCO means motion compensation. Motion compensated reconstruction. And this is a close up in the coronary artery. You can see how nicely we can depict it. And that's the best face image actually here. And this is the same patient. And you always compare the left and the right image. So I need to, uh, I guess I need to hurry a bit. So I will go through them quickly. The right one is always the better one. That's the first patient. And if you look at the coronary artery, you can see it's somehow take, torn in, apart into two pieces at this position. But if you do the motion compensation, it's not. 
in this display, that's a different patient. The patient appears to have two coronaries, yeah, but it should look like that. And that's the third patient, which I find quite impressive because the image is very noisy, yeah, uh, low contrast. You cannot, you cannot hardly see any coronary artery in the FBP image, but you can see how the motion compensation adds up these images nicely together, and you can get sharp uh, images of the coronaries. Yeah, so the, the top is the bad one, and the bottom is now the good one. Okay. So that's basically what uh, will be done in cardiac CT uh, in the future to improve the temporal resolution of the CT scans. And now let's go to the second part of this presentation. We now talk about slowly rotating CT systems and uh, probably for most of us, C-arm systems for interventional use would be the most interesting. But uh, the project that I, we have started doing this work in about like six years ago was funded by Varian, a company that is making linear accelerators for radiation treatment. Um, and they have uh, an X-ray source and a detector mounted on their system. So it's also a comb beam CT system, but it's not for used for intervention. But the solutions we developed here can be applied to C-arm CT systems as well. You see this device is rotating very slowly and obviously not only the heart will be blurred, but also the lung. That's what these radiation therapy guys are worried about. If they have a lung tumor and like it's moving plus or plus minus two centimeters during this scan, they cannot locate it anymore precisely. So they would like to see how it's moving in a sharp way. So uh, what you do and what they do today is do a gated reconstruction. So they do just a gating. So that's, this gives you these kind of three images. They just take the data from one motion uh, from one respiratory, that's about respiratory motion now, one respiratory motion phase and do a reconstruction. For example, the end inhale reconstruction, then they do the mid inhale reconstruction and end exhale and so on. So they can do 10 reconstructions and this, that's what's shown here as a, as a kind of a video. Each of these reconstructions has a lot of artifacts because the system is rotating and once uh, the patient starts breathing, uh, it will rotate by a certain angle and we cannot use the data in between because we only want to use the end exhale data, for example. So we have a lot of data gaps and we have sparse projection sampling. So we get these ugly artifacts. And uh, also these images have a high temporal resolution. We don't like them because we cannot really see what happens in the lung. Yeah? So the first idea to do is uh, to say, okay, we know there's a motion, anatomical motion, so we just compensate for that motion by taking all those frames and registering on a target frame. So we say we want to register all the images into the end exhale image and then sum them up or something like that, uh, and then we get rid of these streak artifacts. And that's what's shown on the right-hand side. We call it standard motion compensation because that's just a standard way of doing it. Um, it looks somewhat better, but uh, the streaks do not really go away. And if you look in the lung, the vessels do, are not sharply depicted. Yeah? The reason is this registration algorithm that tries to warp these images to deform them into the same reference frame, it does not distinguish between anat anatomy and artifacts. So it's also registering those artifacts on top of each other. So that's not good. So we, we developed two, two new methods that we use in combination. One of them is called cyclic motion compensation. We register around a cycle instead of registering everything onto a target frame. Uh, cyclic registration means that there's a penalty for voxels that do not return for their to their original position after one uh, respiratory cycle. So we enforce cyclicity of the result. This reduces our artifacts. The second technique that we use is that we can take the data and perform a prediction of the artifacts by doing a 3D reconstruction, by doing a segmentation of the image to get rid of, uh, of all the motion information, and then we do a forward projection to get virtual raw data and another reconstruction of the same type as on the left side. On the left side, you can see the patient is breathing if you focus on the lung and, and liver. On the right side, you can see it's not breathing anymore due to the segmentation step up, up there, but it's showing the same artifacts. And now we, we can tell the registration algorithm, look, here are the artifacts, so don't care about the artifacts in the left image. And now you can now care about the uh, anatomy and register the anatomy on top of each other. This is the so-called artifact model. And this is the final result we get here for this respiratory motion. That's the gated reconstruction. This is a 3D reconstruction with blurry motion. 
that's gated, that's the standard motion compensation, this is the artifact cyclic motion compensation, and you can see how all these artifacts, or almost all of them, have gone. So we started from these images and get those on the right side. You can look at the vessels in the lung, you can see the tumor nicely, and so on. So this is one of these things, right, uh, that we can do by uh, adding CT know-how to the uh, registration approach. Now this is not the heart, right, but we have something that has a heart and is beating like this mouse, for example. We did a mouse scan. Uh, it has a quite low heart rate, but still, for our purposes, we, we want to use it later, this method for patient imaging. It's quite high, 280 beats per minute, 150 respirations. That's too fast. Let's slow down 90, 90. Or let's even stop the heart beating and let's just look at the lung moving. Now we have a respiratory uh, uh, video here. Right? And we can see how the lung motion is influencing the body of the mouse, but we can also turn around uh, the game and now have the heart beating and stop the lung motion. Yeah? So what you see here is obviously a five-dimensional data set. So it consists of volumetric data for uh, any uh, cardiac phase and for any respiratory phase. So we have five dimensions. And how did we generate this? kind of uh, 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 images. Can we do double gating? Can we just do gating of the images and reconstruct? Uh, if you just give it a, a, a short thought, you will say, no, it's not really possible, because if you do a gating in the cardiac and in the respiratory window of, let's say, 20 and 10 percent, you end up only using 2 percent of all the data for your image, and you, you waste 98 percent. So you get e either you have to measure a very long time, or uh, you waste a lot of dose, for example. So gating is not uh, the, the answer. The answer, again, is motion compensation. This is the 3D scan, this kind of rectangle here. Now, we already know that we can do this respiratory motion compensation by dividing uh, whatever here in 20, the, the scan in 20 respiratory phases. We can now compute the motion vector fields pointing from face to face, so we know where each voxel moves to using the AC-MOCO algorithm. And once we have done this, we have all this motion information, so we can reduce the whole data set into a single target phase or reference phase. I, we can, this is arbitrarily chosen at five here. You can do any reference phase. Convert all the data to correspond to this reference phase and now do the same thing in the cardiac direction. Uh, divide the cardiac dimension in whatever here, 10 gates, and do the motion compensation, compute the motion vector fields, and now we have the full motion information. So now we can convert each combination of respiratory and cardiac phase. So this is a volume here. We can convert it into a different volume corresponding to this respiratory and to this cardiac phase, right? So we can do this. And we always have to go through this reference phase because the reference phase is the only one showing us how to move along the cardiac dimension. And if we do this for all these 200 images of 200 volumes, we can add them back into this green piece, and then that's how we get these nice images. We can also do this with patients, but unfortunately our patients uh, don't have a contrast agent in the variant system, so it looks more boring than the mouse. <laughs> so let's just think of spin-off effects. Uh, that's my last slides here. Uh, what else can we do? And obviously, we can also apply this technology uh, to other, uh, uh, to other uh, modalities. And uh, so this is about, uh, we have a PET-MR system installed five or six years ago at the German Cancer Research Center. People were asking what kind of projects we can do, and we just brought our CT algorithms into this PET-MR domain. So I'm not an expert in PET-MR, but uh, we know a lot about algorithms, and some of them can be applied uh, to this modality. And the idea was uh, what they currently do is uh, they typically have whatever pet acquisition, like maybe five or four minutes per bed position. And uh, so in parallel, you want to do some MR scanning, right? So there's one sequence that allows you to do this kind of motion tracking, but it's also uh, taking the whole five minutes for doing this motion tracking. So that's illustrated with this yellow bar. And we thought we can do it faster. <coughs> We maybe just need one minute for, per bed position for doing this motion tracking, like shown here, and can use the other remaining time to do other sequences of the MR system to do something more interesting for the diagnosis, right, and not just for motion uh, tracking. Alternatively, one can do it in this way. So we can apply our technology <coughs> for the motion compensation to the MR images, and if you compare the MR image taken with five minutes, so that's a gating, no motion compensation here, five minutes acquisition, and that's just one minute acquisition, you get these streaks similar to what we had in the CT images. 
And now you know we can do this artifact model and uh, uh, the cyclic motion compensation. And now we can compute the motion compensated images. And so this is now the one minute per bed position, MR acquisition, and this is the five minutes. So those images are almost uh, uh, identical in particular if you regard the motion vector fields that you want to use. Now we can use those motion vector fields so we know where each morsel is moving to uh, in order to improve on the PET side. So we can uh, take the PET images and uh, add the motion vector fields to the reconstruction and we get uh, improved PET images, right? So this is, uh, you could do the same thing without our uh, software if you do a longer PET acquisition, right? Uh, but we can do it in the same time for four or five minutes per PET position. So this is the uh, PET gating. And on the right side, you can see the motion compensated PET images. <coughs> and these two columns on the right side, they show you what happens if you take the motion vector fields from the five minutes MR or, or only from one minute MR acquisition. Yeah, this gives some you know, analysis of those images. And of course, we can also go to the 5D, so we include the heart. So this is a double gated reconstruction, the second column that you see here. And this column shows you a motion compensated reconstruction um, for uh, the respiratory motion, but the cardiac is gated. It's just done a gating in the cardiac, so you can see that the, you get these images. And if you also do the motion compensation in the cardiac direction, you, you get the images where all the data contribute to each image, right? So um, you get uh, the motion vector fields in all kinds of dimensions. I want to emphasize that this scan is not a cardiac MR scan. We at the German Cancer Research Center, we don't do cardiac MR scans. So we just have patient data of thorax cancer available, so that's why these data might not uh, look as good as if one of you is used to looking at MR, <laughs> at, at dedicated cardiac MR, CTs, uh, uh, cardiac MR scans. Now we have these motion vector fields. These are applied to the MR images here, but of course we can also apply them to the PET images, right? And do the same story as with the 4D. Okay, so this is my last slide. I hope... Uh, I gave you some insight into how cardiac CT is working and how some tricks of how to improve the temporal resolution or of how to improve the reconstruction of undersampled data. And if you are interested in other modalities, uh, wherever I talk about dose reduction in CT and so on, you can think of whatever reconstruction of the, uh, re reduction of the measurement time or acquisition time in other modalities like in MR, for example. So if you have very short acquisition times, you can maybe use one of, or find one of these techniques useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very nice talk, and we can open the floor uh, to questions. Yeah. So, if I understood you well, you don't use any external devices, you know, no belt, no boxes, nothing, you are just using your software. That's a good question. Uh, I didn't. I didn't mention this, but you understood me well. In this, M, in these MR cases, we did not have any external uh, belt or ECG attached, so it was done with intrinsic gating. But in the Varian case, uh, they have this kind of um, uh, RPM system, respiratory monitoring system, where there's a block and it's observed by a video camera. So we were using this, but we don't have the ECG in the variant system. And for the uh, cardiac diagnostic CTs, we always have the ECG. Can you compare maybe this approach with the external belt or something with your approach? And in the case of PET MRI with navigators, you know, Yes. Have you compared these? No, it's complementary. So we, so you're talking about technologies of how to find out when, uh, how the heart cycle is going. And we were talking about, we, we were develop, developing technologies of how to improve the imaging if you only have very little data available. We have done such comparisons, so that's a very good question, but not, uh, not on a very scientific basis. We just found out uh, if we can use the intrinsic data for our purposes or not. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Well, I have a very, a very, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, MR was combined. MR was combined with PET for obvious reasons. Uh, do, do you see, or maybe you're the person to ask this question, do you see advantage of combining CT and MRI rather than PET and MRI? Hmm. I always see advantages if you want to combine CT with anything else, of course. <laughs> but I think this is a very difficult issue. So otherwise people would have done it because the magnetic field will uh, may, uh, give us some problems with the acceleration of the electrons in the X-ray tube. 
Otherwise, you yeah, could have a. I, I mean, conceptually, suppose it, it, it's technically possible. It, do, do you see an advantage of it? Yes, we have a lot of uh, anatomic uh, imaging features in CT that you don't have in MR, right? Uh, so we can see the bones. We have a very short scan time. So you could uh, you could do such a combination. But the the downside of CT uh, uh, is always the X-ray dose, and uh, this will be always regarded negatively. For me, this is a, this is a positive issue because we did a lot of work in my career uh, of how to reduce the X-ray dose, right? But in, a, in such a combined system, you would always uh, fear, have to fear the questions, what about the X-ray x -ray dose? <laughs> All right, so in the interest of, oh, there you go. Go to the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, I keep on missing you guys. A lot of water under the bridge since the last time we had a chance to talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, have you, uh, for the MR uh, PET application in the heart, you're using um, um, less data. Uh, have you also looked at compressed sensing techniques to use even uh, less data than what you're using now? Okay, I have a strong opinion about the compressed sensing. Um, we, d we did a lot of compressed sensing reconstruction in the CT world for this Varian projects and so on. They never work as good as if you allow a, a voxel to move along a trajectory. So if you do something which we call motion compensation, so if you give a voxel the freedom to move somewhere, then uh, uh, you are much better than if you do compressed sensing without allowing the voxel to move. If you combine these two techniques, you can be better. But if you just do compressed sensing on something that is moving and hope you get nice images, they will become nicer maybe than without compressed sensing, but they will never become as nice as if you do motion compensation. 